Welcome to the Forever Classic Podcast, the show seeking enlightenment through video games, films, and other geek culture. I'm Alex McCumbers, and here at my left and at my right are two very awesome folks in the gaming community. Of course, we've got Zachary Snyder, not to be confused with that one guy that directed some DC films. Correct. Welcome back, everybody. Although I feel like you could direct a mean film. Oh, I would love to. We gotta get some people on that. Get them on the phone. And today's guest is Brett Weiss. Hey guys, how's it going? Everything is groovy, man. How are you? Tell us a little about yourself. Well, like you said, my name is Brett Weiss. I have been writing about video games professionally since 1997. I've written 10 books, most of them covering video games from the golden age and thereabouts. I've written books on the NES, Genesis, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, et cetera, et cetera. My latest books are the SNES Omnibus Volumes 1 and 2. And the SNES Omnibus Volume 2 just came out. And I have written for newspapers, magazines, and all that good stuff. So I've been a journalist and a you know full-time writer for over 20 years, and I've written about video games for a lot of different mainstream publications like Film Facts, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, you know, just here and there. Plus, I've written you know for in- industry trade publications as well. So I've just I've been at the video game thing for a long time, and I started gaming in the mid 70s. So I'm, I'm a fossil. I go I go way back. <laughs> <laughs> just to put it into perspective, when you were getting your thing going in '97, I was like five or six just enjoying the idea of games and like pop culture and that kind of thing yeah and so in 97 i started writing for the all game guide which was at allgame.com they're part of like the all music guide which is still going the all game guide died a few years ago but in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, i was writing for this database and their ambitious goal was to describe and review every single video game and computer game ever published and to keep that going you know as new systems came out oh, as wow. new games yeah it was it was a massive major project and for several years i was a writer reviewer and editor for that website and before that i actually i was working on a super nintendo and sega genesis book while those systems were still in stores while they were still coming out with games but back then video game book publishing was just a frac- a tiny fraction of what it is now. There were a few books, Leonard Herman, a few others had written uh, video game books, but there wasn't much at all out there, especially on retro gaming. And so publishers were looking at, you know, I, I sent out the idea to several publishers, you know, about the Sega Genesis slash Super Nintendo book. And, you know, I would just get back puzzled, you know, what is this? Are these hints? Are these tricks, tips, whatever? Like, no, this is, you know, about write-ups, reviews about the games. And they're like, uh, we'll pass. That project never got off the ground. And so when my brother-in-law sent me a job notification availability about, you know, a freelance writing opportunity to write for the All Game Guide, I was really excited because not only were they working on contemporary platforms like Genesis, Super Nintendo, and then PlayStation and Nintendo 64 uh, were starting to come out at that around the mid you know, mid to late 90s when those systems started coming out. I was like, this is great. Not only that, I could write about the Commodore 64, Atari 2600, Odyssey 2, Vectrex, even the Adventure Vision, RCA Studio 2, stuff like this that most people don't have a clue about that I was really excited to write about. So we were filling up that database for several years. And then after 9-11, I got moved back to just part-time working on it because I was off-site. They kept all their, it was a company based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, they kept their on-site writers and pretty much knocked everybody down to part-time. And then after that, they just pretty much let everybody go and they eventually folded. But what was good about the All Game Guide, not only did I write probably, I mean, I mean, I know I wrote hundreds and hundreds, probably over a thousand write-ups for the All Game Guide. Once the All Game Guide went away, see, they, they were also going to publish books, a series of books, because the All Music Guide does as well for albums and stuff. They were going to do something similar for video games. Well, when the All Game Guide went away, I thought, I'll just do that myself, which sounds crazy. But that was the birth of the classic home video game series. When I was at the 2006 San Diego Comic-Con, I met the publisher, McFarland Publishers. At that point, they had never published a video game book, but they had done books about movies and they had done esoteric subject matter you know, like uh, German expressionist films of the 1930s, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, cool. They were open-minded to really esoteric subject matter. Well, writing about video games, even as late as 2006, 2007, that still seemed a little niche, but they were willing to take a chance. They really liked the nostalgic angle of my first book. Uh, I pitched it to them, you know, that would cover the Atari 2600, ColecoVision and television. And the editors with McFarlane, you know, they remembered those systems fondly and they thought they were the perfect publisher for those books. So that's when the classic home video game series began. 2006 is when I met McFarlane at the uh, San Diego Comic-Con and then the book, Classic Home Video Games, 
1972 through 1984 was published in 2007. And that was also right around the time YouTube started getting popular, the Angry Video Game Nerd. It was around the time that Nintendo, the Wii Shop channel, and so that's kind of got the retro gaming ball rolling. And I like to think I played a, you know, a tiny part. The last 12, 13 years, you know, retro gaming has just blown up like crazy. And uh, my book series, the Classic Home Video Game Series, has played a small role in that. It's always cool to see how things kind of came back there, especially when, like you mentioned, the, the Wii Shop channel brought all that to everybody's, like, in-home console. And then everybody and their mom had a Wii plus grandma, so it was just, like, super accessible, ready to go, and then they started releasing things like the TurboGrafx-16 games, which got people kind of interested, and then, like you said, with the popularity of the Anger Video Game Nerd and YouTube, it just, it all kind of came back and, and clicked in a really, really big way, so it's cool to see that you were right there in the middle of it, being a part of that movement and really trying to make something out of that, not just, you know, let's make a retro-inspired game like lots of these indies do, but to really reflect on what has already been released. And that's something that I think is really important. I've always been a fan of reference books. I grew up as a kid reading. My parents had encyclopedia sets, if anybody remembers those, <laughs> on oh, their yeah. book, on the bookshelves. You know, the big, just a general world almanac style encyclopedia set. Plus, they had a science encyclopedia set. Plus, we got the Guinness Book of World Records every year. And that was fascinating to me. You know, before YouTube and the internet and all that, the only way for us to see really weird, strange, out of out of the ordinary things was through things like Ripley's Believe It or Not and the Guinness Book of World Records. So I was utterly fascinated with that kind of stuff. And so writing reference books just kind of came natural to me. I've been in, interested in video games since I started first played them in 1975. I remember seeing Pong in Midway's Gunfight at the bowling alley and the skating rink and those old me electromechanical games where you actually a physical bat with a rotary knob on it you actually hit a physical ball into the play field into these targets things like that racing games where you turn an actual steering wheel and it would move the board and lights would come on i've played some of those stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah they're really interesting they're, they're a lot of fun because they're so tactile and pinball of course i grew up playing but 75 when the video games hit and then christmas of 75 i went over to my cousin's house and their mom bought them whatever they wanted and so they had gotten atari pong for christmas in 75 and we went over there shortly after christmas and I had never known that you could play this at home. I didn't know about the Odyssey system from 1972, the original Ralph Bear system, because none of my friends had that when I was eight years old. Nobody had that, so I didn't know about it at all. Now, did you grow up in the Midwest? Uh, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, so North Texas. Okay, and Texas was a bit of a hotbed for software design, especially with, like, the id kids. Was there anything going on then specifically in Texas on development and, like, software development? Well, it's funny. I was pretty oblivious to the world at large of gaming. I mean, from when I was eight and started playing video games up until I was, you know, in my late teens. I mean, I knew about Texas Instruments and stuff like that, which was based in Fort Worth. But anyway, even, like, I mean, there were retro gaming tournaments local uh, Ben Gold he was in the life the famous life magazine shoot you know with the Walter Day he was on that team video game team and stuff he lived he was Dallas based had no clue about any of that except I did see him on that's incredible but all of that was out of my wheelhouse I was just going to the arcades all the time 1976 my two best friends each had a Fairchild Channel F system so you know I was playing the Fairchild Channel F a year before the Atari 2600 came out but then as I got into my 20s and 30s and 40s you know I realized you know what a you know the Dallas Fort Worth is a it's even more in recent years it's can become a real hotbed for video games. Not only are there all these game publishers in the area, there's the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, which is north of Dallas. There's several retro gaming shows each year. You know, the Game Chasers are based here and they do Retro Palooza in addition to their popular YouTube show. But yeah, as far as, you know, what companies were here, like I didn't know Telegames was here. You know, they were putting out Atari stuff back in the 80s. Had no clue about them. I just knew about Toys R Us <laughs> and what games my friends had and all that kind of thing. But I was pretty Pretty much, you know, I missed out. In 72, I didn't know video games existed. I was five. But 75 is when I became aware of them. So I was there pretty much, you know, just a few years into the start of it. So one good thing about being old is, is growing up with all that stuff. So it was, it's been a lot of fun. Whenever I would talk to my grandfather, and he was like, I think, 98 before he passed away just a few years back, it was really cool because we grew up in rural West Virginia where, like, everything's 10 years behind, you know, California, maybe even 15 years. And so I would talk to him. I'm like, well, Pap, what do you think about how, like, television has changed since, you know, you were a kid? And he'd tell me all these stories of, like, being really engrossed in radio and really loving music and, and radio and just getting able to sit down and watch, like, a black and white television 
was the coolest thing to him. So, I mean, he, he ended up spending up his last few days with a flat screen watching, you know, some of the greatest newscasts and performances on, on the planet. So he really enjoyed watching that evolve and grow in just his lifetime. And one of the interesting things that you mentioned, and this is something that I would, I don't have any perspective of because, of course, West Virginia didn't have many arcades, if any at all, but there was a good, what, 20 some years of arcade really being popular before like the NES brought all that stuff home. And so that's what's fascinating to me is that there were lots of years of the arcade developing. Well, it depends on what you mean by arcade. Arcades go back at least to the late 1800s, you know, with penny and dime machines and things like that were just physical things that happened. But as far as arcade video games, you know, 71, 72. Yeah. So arcades really got popular in the late 70s. Space Invaders, 78. That really brought arcades into the forefront. That's when these little arcades, these little mom and pop arcades started popping up all over the country. Okay, so Fort Worth, Texas, I live in a suburb of Fort Worth, Texas, still do. It's very metropolitan. There's Putt-Putt, Malibu Grand Prix, malls. There's arcades all over. So that's great. But even in these tiny towns, as soon as Space Invaders hit in 78, these tiny little towns, there's a little place outside of Waco called McGregor. Just this little hole-in-the-wall town. They had three arcades in the late 70s just because Space Invaders drove that. And then Asteroids in 79. And then all these other popular games like Missile Command and Defender and Pac-Man, of course, Frogger, Qbert. All these games just made went super mainstream. Pac-Mania took hold. And there were just little arcades popping up all over the place. As a matter of fact, the first time I remember playing Space Invaders was in 78. It was in McGregor. Just a trip to see my dad's family. And we got into this arcade and there's three Space Invader machines lined up in a row and... I just could not believe what I was seeing because before that, there were some space games, but there were nothing like that. Nothing with this ominous heartbeat sound and invaders approaching down the screen and, you know, the high score at the top and all this stuff that just blew my mind. It was so visceral compared to any game that came out before that. So I was just mesmerized. And two years before that was the game that made me like video games even more than pinball because I, I grew up loving pinball. My brother and I were pinball wizards and sharks sort of because we would pop games on games we got really good at and trade those for two for one for a quarter so we could actually go play video games because those suck your quarters away faster. But anyway, in 76, when Breakout came out, that just blew my mind. Here was Pong. You could basically play by yourself but also you know you're batting the ball into these bricks that would disappear so that was mind-blowing you know that started that whole element of gameplay which you saw later with space invaders with tetris you know you're at the bottom of the screen and at the top you're trying to get rid of these objects and that that apparently fascinates people that apparently saw some psychological need <laughs> to make things on the screen disappear because that gameplay element took hold like crazy it does there are a lot of different little visual and audio things worked into games that just really affect our brains in like a super positive way now when i say i didn't grow up around arcades there were a couple arcade games in various places i had one of my earliest memories is sitting down or being held by my dad or something playing a Miss Pac-Man machine in either like a bar or a restaurant. I remember there was a pool table. And of course, we grew up owning the NES, so I, that's my absolute earliest memories. But I do distinctly remember Miss Pac-Man or just standard Pac-Man. It was hard to go to a place, especially in the peak early 80s and even up up into the late 80s. It was hard to find a place that did not have a video game. If you're if you're going like to a, a bar or a pool hall or I remember one time even in the early 80s, the Dallas Mavericks uh, basketball team, there was a time when there were arcade games in the concourse. You're just walking around the arena. You know, you don't see anything like that in an NBA venue now. But the, the little Quickway convenience store right by my junior high, I distinctly remember it had Pac-Man, Phoenix, and Asteroids. And so back then, it doesn't seem like truancy was much of an issue in the 80s. It was kind of overlooked as far as, I mean, at least where I live. I went there before school. And I went there after school and played these games. And, you know, I don't know if we were supposed to be there before school or not, but nobody seemed to mind. And, you know, it'd make me late to school every once in a while, but I got really <laughs> good at asteroids. <laughs> As a matter of fact, with Asteroid, I sort of independently discovered this trick where if you leave one slow floating asteroid on the screen, you can sort of ignore it and you fly straight at the screen. And every time a spaceship comes out, one of those little flying saucers, you could just turn your ship sideways and blast it off the screen. And that would give you points. And then for every, you know, I think it was 10,000 points you scored, you get an extra ship. So I got really good at that method. And I remember one night they shut down quick way and kicked me out. I'd played over four hours on one quarter using that <laughs> method. <laughs> and they finally kicked me out. So that that's my one marathon gaming accomplishment, you know, which is nothing compared to some of these guys 
that play something for 72 hours, like Tim McVeigh with Nibbler or something like that. But Where I did some work with Twin Galaxies, I, I like got to keep track a little bit of these guys doing marathon stuff. And just recently there was an attempt, I think, at Gyrus at like 30-some hours. During the 80s, when all the early 80s, when all the marathon gaming and Twin Galaxies and the video game team and all that stuff, I was largely oblivious to all that. You know, I was just in my own little world playing all these games, you know, not really knowing much of at large what was going on, but I sure enjoyed it. The only reason I have any sort of like old school idea of Twin Galaxies before I started working with them there for a little bit was because, like, I watched a bunch of documentary-style things and, like, tech shows on tech TV and what later became G4. And so when we had satellite television, I was all about finding stuff about video games. But yet... In the arcades, we had a skating rink that had Rampage I was, like, obsessed with. And then one year at 4-H camp, we had a beat-em-up I really liked. It was, like, a ninja-style game. And then in a bowling alley, there was the Dungeons & Dragons game that was made by Capcom, which I adore. It's super, super cool. But I just remember sitting there, like eating pizza or something and hearing, welcome to the D&D world. And I'm like, oh, I need that. I got to get in on that. <laughs> Zach, what arcade memories do you have, if any at all? Actually, it stems from my mom again. She's the one who introduced me to games in general, her and my dad, when uh, I was young. I got introduced to, like, Super Mario on the SNES. So I think it was Mario 3 was the first game I ever actually, like, owned and played. Well, if but, it was the Super Nintendo, was it like the collection that had like all three, Mario 1, 2, and 3 on it? Or was it Super Mario World? Uh, I don't remember. It's a, It's been a long time. <laughs> it was a long time. Well, I know how those those early memories can be fuzzy and they can crisscross. And you just remember playing Mario on the Super <laughs> Nintendo. I know for a fact that I had the uh, Super Mario All-Stars on Nintendo. And I have it somewhere in my stuff. But It's um, such a great collection. It was. I played the hell out of it. Anyway, she was uh, avid about playing stuff with me. Like, she's not really into it anymore. She likes watching. She's not really able to play. But she would always take me to this flea market, which Alex is familiar with. It was in Elkins. Oh, that little place next to the, the trailer shop? Yeah. Now, yeah, I bought some great games there. Well, you I don't think you were around then, but the back side of it, like when you went in, not the side that was like the adult store now. Right, yeah. The opposite side behind where their register sat used to be a big arcade and pool tables and like ski ball Uh, all sorts of stuff now i think recently they went back to that but they they've shut down i think now because i i was there when they were having a like going out of business sale just a year or two ago when we went for tyler's wedding yeah the flea market's still there but not the not the little building i don't think anymore but we would go in there and we'd play i played they had all kinds of good stuff i know they had the uh Oh, shoot. It was some sort of side-scrolling, beat-em-up-esque thing. Not like Double Dragon, but like... Like Final may- Fight or something? Maybe Final Fight, maybe a Battletoad, something. I don't know what they had in cabinets. I can't remember that. I just remember she played a whole ton of pinball, and she could make <laughs> me look like I had no clue what I was doing and didn't belong playing games. One of the coolest things I ever saw my dad do... My dad, he grew up in you know the 60s and 70s and 80s and actually loved technology and electronics. He Initially, his passion was electronics. We were at a pizza place, and I was a teenager, so I was already like head over heels with video games, and I was really into the idea of like either making them or designing them or that kind of thing but um it was super cool because there was a pinball machine and a couple arcade machines and dad's like ah pinball this is my jam and he loved south park and it was a south park machine and he was actually familiar with the south park pinball table and he took the 50 cents that was left over changed after we paid our pizza put in a single quarter and played from the time we ordered our pizza to the time we left that was a good 30 minutes maybe to an hour because it was like a smaller pizza place just getting going and he killed it there were nine lives when we left i was like that was incredible that's awesome that's the first like geek hero moment for my dad i got in trouble one time back in the day your parents would take you to six flags and you just had to have an agreed upon meeting place because there were no cell phones of course or anything and so the parents were supposed to pick us up at nine or ten or nine or something like that like probably an hour before the park closed or whatever well they had a pinball machine there i was having a really good game and i just this was one of these marathon sessions on one quarter and i refused to leave (laughs) so we got out of the car about half an hour after we were supposed to and man my friend's dad was so pissed he tore into us but (laughs) to this day it was worth it it was it was quite a game (laughs) totally worth. now i realize it was very rude and disrespectful and not very selfish but you know at the time I, i wasn't about to leave that table well yeah I know I've met a lot of people that they're real score chasers here recently online and been to a couple meetup groups in Pittsburgh and they like put in some work when it came to pinball. They had 
a couple of them among them with like world records and they were just like incredibly talented. Well, you know, what's funny about pinball that I learned, I started going to the Texas Pinball Festival. The first one was in 1999 and, you know, they just had the 20th year of it this year, obviously. And um, I had always thought expert pinball players always just assumed all of them were really good at shoving the machine, just shy of tilting it, you know, manipulating the ball. But there are a lot of top-notch tournament players that never shove the machine. And I was surprised about that. It's all about aiming. Now, some of them do. You know, some of them will shove the machine to, you know, give the ball some English or to influence it. But a lot of them don't. They're just standing there pushing the, the buttons to operate the flippers, and they don't shove the machine. I, I thought that was sort of a prerequisite for being an expert player, but apparently not. That's super cool, because I've always considered pinball to be like, you know, it's fairly arbitrary and luck-driven, but, you know, as I got older, and after Dad showed me that it really is a skill, yeah, that's awesome that you can do it without doing any shakes. Some of these people are just expert at aiming. It's amazing. I used to be a lot better at pinball than I am now, but I'm still decent. Just, man, back in the day, we used to play, and we didn't have much money growing up. You know, we'd go to Malibu Grand Prix or Land of Oz or Aladdin's Castle, some of these arcades, you know, in the early 80s, late 70s with, you know, maybe 50 cents in our pocket, maybe a dollar. Maybe we could find a few more in the coin slots. You know, we'd push all the buttons to try to release coins that were stuck. We might find a little bit here and there, but, you know, so we can, we had to get, we got really good at pinball just for, out of necessity, you know, because we didn't have a bunch of extra money to play it. We would also wait for when someone would be playing a game of pinball that was a parent or somebody that was obviously not great at it. We would kind of watch them. And as soon as they were through, a lot of times they would just walk away. So we would stand there to wait and see if that game matched because they didn't know about matching. They would just walk away. And so 10% of the time, you know, one out of 10 chance, their score would match the little match number at the end and pop a free game. And so we would play it based on their game. And that, <laughs> oh. Those were just things we had to learn because we didn't have any money. That's crafty. That's awesome. <laughs> but necessity was the mother of invention for sure there. No doubt. Mm-hmm. Zach, did you do any pinball? And it sounded like you were going to say something about it. I didn't play a whole bunch myself. Like, I was unfamiliar with table tilt in pinball f- p- till probably, like, five years ago. Oh, I didn't wow. Even- yeah, not a clue. Like, because mom showed me how to play, just like you were saying. You just stand there and you work on your aim skill. But I'd never once had seen her tilt the table when I went to visit some of my friends in Morgantown that I'd worked with acting, on the big street of bars and clubs right downtown, there was just one random door that looked super sketchy, and it was, like, completely stained, like, that old, like, dull yellow from people, like, smoking over the years. But it just went into a basement, and the whole bottom everything of this building was just wall-to-wall pinball machines. I think I know the one you're talking about, because either they just recently moved to a new location... Or something, because that group, I believe, are doing, like, live streams and meetups weekly. It's called, like, Star Something Pinball. If you look for Morgantown, West Virginia Pinball, y'all will find it. There's, like, a Facebook group and a, a whole little group. I'll have to check that out. But, yeah, I, there's so many tables in there that I've never, ever seen. But being a huge fan of Doctor Who, I just kept playing on the Doctor Who table. Oh, yeah, of course. There's always that one themed one you kind of connect to. For me, yeah. I'll always have that memory of the South Park one. So whenever I see the South Park table, I get really excited. So one of the main questions I want to ask you, Brett, what are some of the games that really influenced you? Because for like me and Zach, it's games like Super Mario World and then like Final Fantasy, the PlayStation Final Fantasies and Metal Gear Solid for Zach. I actually like, I'm a big fan of action games. I don't think I have the patience for role-playing games and for complex strategy games. Hopefully it's that I don't like the intelligence. I think I might just like the patience. That's what I'm going with anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story. <laughs> there are some RPGs I've played and enjoyed, and there's some I've, I've, there's a lot I've played out of necessity, you know, just for the books and whatnot, but I don't particularly enjoy them. I don't like roaming around, not knowing where to go, or getting. Lo- I tend to get lost. I don't have to get a sense of direction. And so I prefer action-oriented games. I love shooters, maze games, climbing games. I mean, there are genres I enjoy that they don't even have anymore. (laughs) At least they don't call them that. Like climbing games, they just call fixed screen platformers now. Games like Donkey Kong and Space Panic and Crazy Climber, Burger Time. I love those games, and I love maze games like Mousetrap and Ladybug, Miss Pac-Man. My top 10 or 20 games list always looks different than, you know, most people. Most people put Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VII or whatever. You know, mine will have, like, Mr. Do and Dig Dug and Time Pilot, <laughs> Asteroids <laughs> Deluxe and all this stuff on it. I'm, I'm old school, but I just like the pick-up-and-play aspect of the older games. And there's some, during the PlayStation 2 era, I became a fan of the third-person hack-and-slash, the God of War games. Huge fan of Maximo, 
both Maximo games. I don't even have you guys played those Maximo Ghost to Glory. I'm very familiar. I'm very familiar with the cover art, and I have lots of friends that talk about it, and I've like seen gameplay, and I know it's kind of like a spiritual thing to Ghosts and Goblins, but I have not played it. It's on my list to get though for sure. I have not played it either, and honestly, I don't think any of my friends played it, so I don't. I'm not super familiar with it. Maximo, the first one, Ghost of Glory, got a lot of press coverage at first. It was on several magazine covers and whatnot, but it really flies under the radar these days. And I love that game, but you know, I like I like stuff that I can sit down and pick up and play without reading a thick manual or wandering around you know i like the enemies to come at me right away you know i don't want to look for them for sure you mentioned god of war i adore the god of war series front to back i just recently played through all of them including the new one the new one's great and you know those those kind of games you know there's some non-linear aspects to those and there's some you know you have to figure out you know how you use your weapons and all that stuff and that's fine you know as long as it you know I, i don't mind something relatively complex like that that's cool you know i like learning that stuff and it's fun but RPGs just kind of, I don't know, I don't have the patience for them, I don't think. Although I did, you know, like I said, there's some I've enjoyed. I, I like, the, you know, some of the Zelda games, of course, but those are more action RPGs, of course. But by and large, at the end of the day, I usually sit down and play something quick and easy to figure out. I'm a bit of that, too. I play a lot of games based on, you know, I need to do a review or I'm doing this for a project or whatever. But anymore, if I'm just playing for absolute fun, I almost always play something that I can finish in a weekend. Here recently, I'm really into the idea of picking up these, like, old PS3, PS2 shooters, like your kill zones and resistance and stuff, and just going through one every weekend, and I just enjoy it. I went through Onimusha. We just talked about that. Oh, man, that I've got the trilogy, I believe it was, right? When there are three of them? There are three initially, and then there's, like, a fourth one that most people don't like. There's like eight games, I think, altogether, including a couple ports. Right. Well, I'm thinking of the PS2. I have the first three on the PS2 They're just good. sitting on my shelf. I don't remember. I got them for super cheap or something, but I've got all three just in mint shape on my shelf thinking, you know, I'm going to play these one of these days. <laughs> you know, they're just sitting there. <laughs> I've always heard those are fun. I can't recommend them enough, and they flew under my radar when I was, like, in that prime of playing on the PS2, but I played them front to back, 1, 2, and 3, and adored it. Anymore, I think the best way to enjoy them is probably the remaster for the first game, but the first game's a masterclass. I love it. I think it's excellent. Great. I I played a lot of Shinobi at that time, the PS2 version of Shinobi. Hard as nails. I'm familiar with Shinobi, like, on the Genesis. My friend loved Shinobi 2 or 3, I think. Third Shinobi on the Genesis is fantastic. I mean, it's just this big production. It's such it's such a great title for a 16-bit game as far as it's it looks so great. And it, these cinematic production values and stuff, it added some new stuff to the series. But the Shinobi on the PS2 is basically your uh, third-person hack and slash. Kind of like the Ninja Gaiden that was on the Xbox? Yes, a lot like that. And it's, cool. it's tough, but it's a lot of fun. But those those two games, you, yeah, Ninja Gaiden and Shinobi for during that era, I played the heck out of both of those. I love that real hard. I even uh, enjoyed uh, Conan on the Xbox. You know, it was a similar type of game. Not as good as those, but still pretty good. I like the kind of like hero-based action games. I think they're a lot of fun. There's a lot of games in my like favorites list that include that kind of style. Yeah, I, I prefer that to the first person. I'm not a big fan of first person shooters. I don't know if it's just the controls or the perspective or what. I did love Halo. Who doesn't, right? Um, <laughs> and, and a few others, but but I, I definitely preferred the third person games. I think I'm I have a preference for third persons as well more often than not. And so many of those have, you know, are fantasy genre, which I really like. Oh, I do love the fantasy stuff. The military era of the late 2000s, or the mid-2000s, I guess. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of those shooters, except for the fantasy-driven ones like Gears of War, Halo, the ones that really had a lot of effort and thought put into them. Yeah, Halo was just hard not to like. It was so cinematic, and just the voice effects came in at the right time. It just was story-driven, you know, it was just a really fun game. And, you know, it was like a first-person shooter for people who don't necessarily like first-person shooters. It was a very good direction for that series. I really like Reach, too, in the later years. I thought Reach Mm. was really good. Oh, Reach was so good. It's coming to PC soon. That's pretty cool. Oh, man. Toast is going to freak out. That is her absolute favorite. (laughs) I don't think I've done any PC gaming. I'm not, well, personal computer gaming since Dark Forces on the Mac. (laughs) Oh, wow. I don't use my computer for games for whatever reason. Probably because it's easier just to use the consoles. There's something to be said about that, right? I think in late college, so about five or six years ago, I got my first like actual hardcore, this is my PC, I'm going to build it for gaming. And it's just that much more complicated than a console that you're not necessarily focused on playing the game, you're focused on tweaking it to your particular computer. And that can take a lot of the fun away from me personally. Some people like that. 
Oh, yeah, there's people that swear by it and think I'm crazy for not playing any PC games, but it's just not my thing at all. Yeah, no, I love mouse and keyboard control, specifically for first-person shooters, I think is perfect. Right. But yeah, I love the simplicity of here's the game presented, and you pop it in your system of choice, and it just goes. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about the SNES Omnibus specifically. Now, for anybody unaware, this is a collection of every single American release on the Super Nintendo coming in two volumes. The first volume was, was it last summer or the summer before, Brett? Last summer. Last summer, yeah. And I actually helped out on this project a little bit. It's like this massive collaborative process, but was really driven by, like, most of the collaborators, I think, added to what you had already done. But it was really cool to see like a lot of different people in the gaming world kind of come together for it. Yeah, I did the basic write-up for each game just to describe the gameplay details, the synopsis, and that kind of stuff to try to give you a good, concise, but thorough overview of each game. And within those descriptions, a lot of times review elements were, you know, critiques were built in as well if I had a ton of experience with each game. But the games I were, you know, just played a, for a little while or, or weren't that didn't grab me strongly or that, that I just didn't feel. What I wanted to do for each game was supplement it. Even the games that you know like the back of my hand, I wanted to supplement each game right up with thoughts from gamers in the community. I wanted programmers, developers, video game store owners, video game convention organizers. I wanted stories to supplement the games because, you know, a book of reviews is fine, but what really grabs people are stories. People love to read stories. And, you know, before there was even the written word, people pass information to each other and entertain each other by telling stories. I think humans just resonate towards stories more than they do, you know, just sort of descriptions. And so, especially when they're personal stories, nostalgic stories, growing up playing the games or just, you know, different kind of experiences playing the games, whether you're renting at Blockbuster, whether you're going to Toys R Us to buy a game and, you know, getting the ticket off the wall and taking it into off the aisle and taking it up to that magical store up front that was like the Scrooge McDuck store with all those video games, tons of video games in it. They opened that magical door to get your game. And if you if you snuck a pee, you could see stacks and stacks of games in there. You know, people now didn't grow up buying games that way. And so the book is a window not only to gaming in the 1990s, but just sort of culture in the 1990s. You know, what was going on then? And so uh, a wide variety of writers, you know, everyone from reviewers and bloggers and journalists, you know, all the way to programmers that worked on some of the game contributed stories. So that's, to me, I wanted to write each description, you know, and, and have that be the basic sort of skeleton of the book. But then I wanted the color to come from all these contributing writers and also included what I call notable quotables, which are quotes from old magazines and then some quotes from websites as well, just so you can get a well-rounded review of each game and, and it's not all just coming from me. I, I like that aspect because I'll be flicking through and find those old quotes from you know whatever article it happens to be and sometimes that's available readily online and I can go read that perspective of when it came out rather than the reflectionary period that I have a tendency to take with games especially anything that I'm doing like when it comes to writing about retro stuff. Yeah, it's interesting to see what people were saying, what reviewers were saying about the games at the time they were published and then what some people with a, you know, retro slant playing them now looking back at them, what they say about them. So, I like to give a good write and I'll I'll even quote people with posing views. No, for sure. Two or three quotes about a game and one reviewer liked it and one didn't. But that that just gives you more of a well-rounded view of each game. Now, what was the the kind of driving idea? Because a lot of your books focus on like a year frame rather than sorting it out by console. What was the idea of doing it by console and then like alphabetically for each and every game? Okay, that's a good question. So the classic home video game series, it's three books. The first one covers Atari era. Second one covers the NES, Master System, and Atari 7800. And then the third one covers the systems that came out in 1989, Sega Genesis, Neo Geo, and TurboGrafx. So you've got everything up to that point until the Super Nintendo came out. Well, I was working on a fourth edition of the classic home video games book, and I was going to do a book that covered the Super Nintendo, CDI, 3DO, and Atari Jaguar, because those are the systems that were next in line in terms of chronology. I started working on that, and I thought, you know, with retro game book publishing getting way, way more different than it was 10 years ago, 12 years ago when I was starting. You know, there's there's coffee table books, there's full color, there's screenshots all over the place. There's, you know, the, just the retro gaming market for books has changed drastically. The books that are being published now, the full color and all this, there was nothing like that, hardly at all. So I thought, you know, I need to up the ante a little bit. I need to find a different publisher. 
the big systems to collect for are NES, Super Nintendo, Genesis, N64, and now GameCube. I mean, those are the big systems. Store owners will tell you those are the games people are looking for. And I thought, okay, I'm at the Super Nintendo. The book publishing industry has changed. I need to go full on Super Nintendo. And I need to make this a large edition with screenshots for every game. And, you know, I just changed, flipped it 180 and just to go full on Super Nintendo with much better production values. And it definitely shows in the books, too. I mean, these are full color. There's these awesome, like, screenshots, old artwork. It's pretty fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate that. And a lot of the credit can go to Schiffer Publishing. You know, it was my job to come up with the images. I had help with that. I mean, I scanned a lot of stuff in my collection, but also had uh, Nintendo Age was a big help. Moby Games was a big help in getting these images and some others. I, I, I I'm not going to name everybody because I don't want to leave anybody, you know, leave one person out or something. But I've had help, you know, tracking down some of the... And the same thing happened with the classic home video games books. The actual games and manuals, you know, I borrowed a lot of stuff to be able to write about every game. And with the Super Nintendo books, you know, I borrowed some stuff and people did some scans for me and things like that. You know, it's a collaborative effort. Very few books, if any, are written, especially a massive reference book like this, are the work of just one person. You know, it takes a lot of help, you know, from, you know, my wife helping me with my computer. You know, te- I've had some technological problems you know questions come up about the technology you know about different things Mm -hmm. Uh, a friend of mine is an expert on working on computers i had suddenly the folder my my book was in was locked up you know and so things like that so along the way i've had a lot of help and the best and most fun help i've had was with the contributing writers and there's actually there are a handful of new writers for the snes omnibus volume two when i say new i mean added to the project one john jackson miller who's a New York Times best-selling author of some Star Wars and Star Trek books. He wrote a piece for one of the games, and then I think it was Super Conflict, I believe. And then uh, Kelsey Lewin, really popular YouTuber, wrote a story about Packy and Marlin. I believe that was the game she wrote for. And her big thing with collecting is unique and oddball items and just weird stuff like the Wonder Swan system and the Game Boy sewing machine game. You know, the, she loves the bike the, that she recently... She's gotten really good about making these historical videos, too, now, from the connection with metal jesus yeah she's great she does a great job she's right up there with the gaming historian norm crusoe as far as you know production and yeah. Just, you know, take, taking the subject matter seriously and stuff. But yeah, she, I was at that Portland Retro Gaming Expo when she won the life cycle in the auction. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, <laughs> but yeah, her, her story in the SDS Omnibus Volume 2, she described, you know, she with Pecky and Marlin, her story relates how and why she got into collecting oddball stuff in the first place. So you get a lot of stories here that you're not going to find anywhere else, you know, around... Half the games or more for each volume has a supplemental a nostalgic story by somebody in the community. And it's funny that you mentioned Kelsey, because that is one of the more public folks, I guess, in, in the volume two. Her and Cody's podcast, the Game Blitz podcast, is actually what solidified my idea of doing this show. And then Zach also being a fan of podcasts, he's like, yo, podcasts are sweet. And I'm like, I really like gaming podcasts. And then somehow we got here and it just ended up being super cool. Yeah, she's, I mean, she's only in her mid 20s, but she carries herself and has the knowledge and the willing to chase after the knowledge. Someone much more seasoned, of a seasoned professional, you know, she's, she's really something else. Yeah, they, they've got a great thing going with the Pink Gorilla store that they run. Her and Cody run DS Koopa on Twitch. Definitely give those folks a follow. I'll try to include some links in the show notes for those folks, but they've got a great thing. Her mom lives about 20 or 30 minutes from me. I live in Fort Worth, and, she, and her mom lives in Grapevine, and she grew up going to school in this area, the North Texas area, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And so she comes home from time to time. Well, uh, last year sometime, we met up since she's on the local here, and she was in town visiting her mom. And me and her and her brother went to the National Video Game Museum. We went to Nerdvana, which is this video game-themed restaurant, and just had a blast. Had so much fun. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, she's really cool, really uh, mature beyond her, her years. I think our friend Nathan that we had on the podcast for the Godzilla episode talked about either being from Fort Worth or something. There's a lot of things going on in Fort Worth. <laughs> Dallas Fort Worth has has blown up like crazy. I mean, Screw Attack uh, used to be based here. They've moved to Austin and gotten absorbed by Rooster Teeth. I believe that's the what's happened to them. But but yeah, there's a lot going on. There's like I said, Retropalooza. There's the Let's Play Gaming Expo that that's now every summer. They ha- they hold some major tournaments. You know, lots of developers based here. There's arcades all over the place. Free Play Arcade which most of the locations there's three or four locations now most of the locations have over 100 games it's 10 bucks to get in and everything is on free play so it's an incredible deal so yeah it's a it's a happening place for retro gaming for sure and gaming in general 
I definitely want to come take a visit for the museum specifically. But yeah, that sounds awesome. I know Pittsburgh has been picking up too in the retro gaming, and then Portland, of course, feels like it's a really good hotspot for it. And Seattle and those sort of places, driven by a lot of this YouTube content and keeping things in the conversation, and a lot of those games being really studied. When it came to the book itself, I mean, did you ever have the thought of doing anything other than literature, like a podcast or a video series or anything, or has it always been kind of focused on books and why? Well, I've always been a writer. In, in the late 90s, I, well, not always. Since I was a kid, I've been interested in books and writing. And I mean, my mom used to take me to used bookstores, and I'd buy the piles of peanuts, the, mag, the little Charles Schultz uh, paperback books, Mad Magazine, comics, all that stuff. I just read voraciously, and I've always been interested in reading and writing. And then in my early to mid 20s, I finally got serious about it. And I wrote short stories. I wrote fiction for some different small press publications. I was a quarter finalist in the L. Ron Hubbard Writers of the Future contest. And I got actually a written letter from New Yorker magazine telling me to keep sending them stuff, which was just blew my mind because that's very rare. They Their slush pile has got to be huge, you know, through the roof. But that lasted for a little while. It just, it never, it wasn't really taken off. I mean, I was getting a little success here and there, but but in 1997, when I started writing for the All Game Guide, I switched to nonfiction because I could get paid right away. And there were a lot more outlets for nonfiction. And so I started writing for the Comics Buyer's Guide. I, became, I got on their review crew for about 12 years. I was writing for the longest public, running publications in comics of all time, the Comics Buyer's Guide. And I started getting articles published in Fangoria and a bunch of magazines that don't even exist anymore. So yeah, it's been all about the writing. And cup two, about... Three years ago, I started a YouTube podcast with this guy named Curtis Newton, and he's a PlayStation 4 guy. He hosted a website called Hold Square, as in holding down the square button on the PlayStation on the controller. So it was Hold Square, and he talked. I'm heavily into retro gaming, obviously. Well, he's heavily into the new stuff coming out for the PlayStation 4, and he's a big Nintendo guy as well, or was a big Nintendo guy, I should say, which what I'm about to tell you. So we started this podcast, and we had a great rapport. We would just sort of sit there, you know, razzing each other, but cover the news and gaming. Uh, we'd cover some retro stuff, what's going on in the news, a little bit like Pat and Ian, that kind of kind of show. Oh, the CU podcast. I like them. Yeah, yeah, that's a good show. And so we, we kind of had that rapport. You'd go, go back and forth. You know, he would cover all this new stuff coming out, and I would talk about back in the Stone Age and whatnot. And we had a lot of fun. Well, he started feeling bad. He started getting headaches and some dizziness and stuff, and he, uh, he kind of Kind of the podcast sort of took a back seat and then we'd record we just you know record here and there and then he finally stopped and thought well i guess he's just kind of you know wanting wanting to get out of it and i knew he had had some medical issues in the past we were at a star trek convention one time and we were about to watch william shatner and right before shatner came out he had to go home because he was in migraines i was like okay this is serious well my wife and i were on the way to nerdvana one night a couple of years ago over two years ago because it was around christmas time and it's that video game restaurant i was telling you about they were having a big media event for that like a some kind of press thing that i was invited to and on the way there we got the phone call that curtis had died and so not to bring the podcast down too much here but, but yeah so that pretty much ended my youtube career right there because i don't really have the production capabilities or interest or anything like that i'll be happy to do a podcast or be on a regular podcast even or youtube or anything but i'm not i don't really have the time or the initiative or the ability to to produce anything like that but he did all that stuff and it was great just to sit in with him each week and do that but uh but yeah so that's that's gone so hopefully you know i can get something like that started up again with somebody else but right now there's nothing and one of the cool things that come out of that situation is i'm sure that those old podcast episodes are still even on like iTunes or whatever. Yeah, there you can find them on YouTube. You know, there were video podcasts and okay. you, we didn't get a chance to do very many. I don't even remember how maybe 10 or 12 or 15 or something like that, but you know, it's all kind of a with his death, it's all kind of a blur now. It's hard to watch now, but we had a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. People were telling us that, you know, they were really getting a kick out of our show and it's just unfortunate. You know, he died at 43, you know, way way ahead of his time, so that yeah. was unfortunate. Now, was that the Hold Square podcast, or what was the actual name of it? Yeah, it was, I believe it, we called it the Hold Square Video Game. We went back and forth on names, but I think it, at some point we called it the Hold Square Video Game Podcast or something like that. Because I'm familiar with that name, as well as the Push Square, which, was that two different things, or is that the same group of people? I'm not familiar with Push Square, so it must be two different ones. I wonder if they were, like, inspired by your all's production or something. I don't know. It could just be a coincidence. Yeah, yeah it I'm could be. Of, like... Hold Square Video Game Podcast, and the Hold Square Reapers was the name of 
they had a group, you know, the Hold Square Reapers were, you know, they were gamers all over the, you know, there were some in England, you know, you know, in Europe and stuff and based all over. And every once in a while they would have a meetup in the Dallas Fort Worth area and they would come here. And, you know, one time they checked out the National Video Game Museum. One time they checked out Jerry World, which is the Cowboys Stadium, you know, in Arlington. So they, they loved seeing where the Dallas Cowboys played and get to tour that stadium and stuff. But yeah, it was a whole gaming community, the whole Square Reapers and I think the website, I don't, I don't even know if they're doing that website anymore. So it was unfortunate. It was great being able to talk about whatever was going on. You know, there's always retro gaming news now, whether it's a new retro console or some kind of, you know, something or some scandal or something or high score deal. But so it was fun getting to talk about the events each week. But if the opportunity presents itself where I can just sit in for an hour or two each week on a regular podcast that has a decent following, I'd like to do that because, you know, these days it's really important to have some kind of, I think it's YouTube presence, you know, it would help sell books for sure. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Anybody who's interested in in adding somebody to their podcast, it seems like Brett might be interested in the idea. Yeah, if you've got you know a reasonable following and just like to have fun, uh, I, I'm, I'm your guy. Nice. <laughs> but yeah, if anybody wants to check it out, just type in "hold square" one word, video game one word, podcast, and you'll find several episodes. I'll have to look it up later, just because I I love the you know me. I, I'll eat up any of this historical stuff well see the the sad part is is we were just getting started i mean we would film it in my game room we had no post-production it was pretty low rent it was you know just a couple of microphones and a laptop and stuff but as we went he was going to start adding piecing together you know some post-production stuff some environmental stuff you know he, he had big plans for it but that all died with him yeah so back to the well Here's the interesting thing. I think that games have this really, and maybe it's all media, we really seem to connect with media, and maybe it goes back to that old, 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 old adage of, you know, sharing stories and capturing some of this stuff that really makes us human. So what are your thoughts about the fact that games just have a tendency to naturally bring people together? I think that's the best thing about gaming. Through doing these retro gaming conventions, I do a lot of shows each year to promote and sell my books. And I mean, the coolest thing to come out of this is I've got, I've made a lot of friends and there are probably, I mean, I, I've known tons of people now through gaming, but there are probably four or five people I know I'm going to be friends with for the rest of my life through these gaming shows without question. So uh, yeah, it's great. You know, people just get together, laugh, have a good time and, you know, bond over a uh, mutual interest. And some of these gaming conventions, you know, you'll, you'll go to the show during the day. And then when the show's over, you might go to somebody's house to play the games you bought, or you might meet up at free play arcade after, you know, cause people are in from out of town, you know, and want to do something at night. So it's a very communal experience gaming. You know, it can be. I've definitely experienced that where you're at a convention and, you know, you're doing your convention thing, whatever it might be. And then, you know, once the, the doors are closed or everybody's ready to kind of turn in for the night sometimes that can turn into a whole extra event there's been several nights where we're like all right well now we're going to go to a, a nice restaurant because we never do that or we're going to go check out some of the local hot spots yeah and some of the bigger shows might have like a party afterwards or something you know at the hotel or at the convention center so yeah it's, it's a blast it's a lot of fun i've, I've uh had a great time, and the last couple of years, things have really amped up, and convention promoters have been reaching out to me to be a guest at their show, and sometimes I'll reach out, you know, because a writer isn't necessarily as well-known as a YouTuber or whatever, so in some cases, I'll reach out, and then when they discover who I am or, you know, research it, they'll say, ah, thanks, but no thanks, or they'll say, oh, yeah, great, we'd love to have you out, can you do a panel, you know, it just, it varies. Yeah, hmm. I know doing a panel is something that we'd really like to do, and if I had been able to go to PAX East, I'd have jumped on board with a couple of the ones that some of my peers were working on. Well, it's funny. I used to be terrified of speaking in public. I mean, even something goofy like a video game convention where you're just talking about something you obviously know a lot about. Back in the 90s, I owned a couple of com early 90s, I owned a couple of comic book stores. And like when the news media would come out to cover like the death of Superman, the news came out. Adam West, we had an autographing at our store. He came out and they had serial killer trading cards. That was a big controversy. They came out and talked to us. I never wanted to be on screen. You know, they would interview my business partner, my brother-in-law. Yeah. And so I'm way different now. You know, it doesn't, it, it just came with experience. You know, I've been interviewed a lot of times and I've, I've done panels now. So I've gotten through time I've and just being old and crotchety, you know, I've gotten to where I don't care anymore. <laughs> so I can, you know, do these panels and whatnot and it doesn't phase me anymore like it used to, which is nice. Another perk of getting old, I guess. 
say what you want. I look forward to the days when I'm an old crotchety man and I'm like, <laughs> get off my lawn. <laughs> Shut up, kids. I'm playing Chrono Trigger. I never right, did exactly. finish it. Now's the time. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think I've ever had too much of a trouble talking in front of people, uh, except for high school. I don't think Alex met me in shy days. No, I, no, I only met you in like post theater. Hey, I'm Zach and I'm really good at talking to folks. <laughs> um, and I remember giving a talk on Superman in college. So there's something I really know a lot about. And I, I'm so glad people didn't have cameras on their phones back then because I'm sure somebody recorded it and it would be haunting me for the rest of my life. It was so awful. <laughs> <laughs> somehow I lucked out. For whatever reason, whenever I got to the point where I was taking public speech classes, something clicked somewhere and I was just like one of the best presenters in every single class not to saying that the other kids you know didn't really put some for some effort and do some great work but i think one of the first speeches we ever did i stood up and did my thing and there was a class of like maybe 10 kids we normally had classes of upwards to 30 and one of the guys turned around he's like dude that was sick how did you do that because everybody was just learning and they were getting into it and i i couldn't tell you why it happened i can't say that about me i'm still get tongue-tied from here and there you know <laughs> But uh, that's good. It's a good uh, quality to have. I think everybody does from time to time. But yeah, Zach, a lot of yours, I imagine, came from the like theater angle, which we talked about a lot in our Why We Love Video Games episode. Yeah, yeah, it definitely did. Yeah, if it wasn't for Eileen, I probably would still be a very, very shy person. And nowadays, we're just putting ourselves out there every day, you know, whether it's in our daily lives or even on social media and stuff. Because I feel like putting yourself out there is super important nowadays. Yeah, it really is. You have to promote yourself or nobody else will. Speaking of promotion, Brett, once you got Schiffer Publishing, what did that process kind of look like? Did you have to, like, organize all your files on a folder? Was there some sort of, like, data thing that they had to go through? Well, real quick, so I had done the classic home video games books for McFarland Publishers. I actually pitched them a book called The 100 Greatest Console Video Games 1977 through 1987. They actually turned it down. They're sort of a literary publisher, and they don't like top 100, top 50. They don't like anything that sounds, you know, listy like that. They don't. They, they want to be more literary sounding. And right. so they actually turned the book down. And so I took it to Schiffer, which I'm really glad I did because Schiffer, The 100 Greatest Console Video Games, they, they liked the idea and went with it and published it and Barnes & Noble brick and mortar stores actually picked it up. And so every Barnes & Noble in the U.S. ordered three copies of that book. So I was really glad I went with Schiffer. Plus, it's full color, hardcover, and all that stuff. So that worked out well. And so that was actually published before the SNES Omnibus. Then when it came time for me to do the SNES Omnibus, once I thought of that, instead of adding to the classic home video game series... I took it to Schiffer, and they really liked the idea, especially since the Super Nintendo was such a hot collector system right now. And so, yeah, I just I just write up the Word document, and I don't know if that's what you're asking, how I submit it or... Yeah, yeah, like what's the, the actual, you know, software side? Just a Word program, you know, just I just write it on Word and then put it on a flash drive and mail it to them. And they also, for some reason, they still also wanted a printed out copy. I guess maybe it's easier to edit that way because you can just page through it and mark it in red. So I print out a copy and send it on, also send out a flash drive. And then I just send them a bunch of JPEGs of, of all the photos. Now, did you like organize these in folders based on the game it was? And like, say you've got a folder for Magical Quest, one of my favorites that I think I actually talked about in your book. Just by letter. Each one is named precisely so they can piece it out when it reaches them. So yeah, and uh, I send all that to them and then they do all the design work and they'll send me some early designs to see what I think and if I have any suggestions. So, so the page layouts and stuff, that was all their side of things rather than you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which is like, good because I don't, I don't know anything about all that. I can make, aesthetically, I can make recommendations, but yeah. as far as the technical stuff goes, that's nothing I know about. I, you know, I can make recommendations and, and all that kind of stuff, so... This was the first, the SNES Omnibus Volume 1 was the first book I've ever done that actually had a dust jacket, so that was kind of nice. So, anyway, yeah, so that's, it's on, it's on Schiffer. They, they, they have some really good production values, so I'm happy with their, uh, with them. You talked a little bit about how the collaboration process was. I mean, what was the thought process behind even wanting to do that aspect, and how did you kind of pitch that to the publisher? Well, it occurred to me, 
that see Pat Contry's Nintendo NES book. I did over fifty uh, reviews and what he calls reflections for that book. I didn't know you were in that. That's really cool. Yeah, he had see back in I met him back in two thousand and ten at the Screw Attack Game Convention, and we got to talk. And he he came to my booth and saw my NES book, and he he said, you know, I've been thinking about you know he's the NES punk and you know hardcore NES fan obviously, and he said he had been thinking for some time about doing a NES book, and so he was looking at mine and stuff, and then later on when he decided to go through with it and do it. He, I'd talked to him a few times between then at different shows and whatnot, and messaging and so forth. And he asked me if I wanted to be a contributing writer on his NES book. And I said, sure, you know, that sounds great. You know, I was flattered and all that. And I wrote over 50 of the reviews and reflections in there. Well, the reflections are more informal memories and just sort of colorful information about each game. And I want to do something like that for my Super Nintendo book, but without copying that idea. Mm -hmm. And so the idea I came up with was Insider Insights, which has commentary about each game, but not necessarily from me or from... He had different people writing his book. He wrote over 400 of the you know game descriptions for his book. Whereas I wrote all of them for mine, but I wanted color added to each game that's not necessarily from me. I wanted a, a wide variety. And I didn't just want like a fan's perspective. Nothing wrong with that. I, I wanted to go a little different way than that. I wanted perspective of people that are in the industry, even if it's a loose connection, like a, somebody that used to review for Electronic Gaming Monthly back in the day. Like Martin Alessi used to write for Electronic Gaming Monthly. He, he did some colorful write-ups. So I just wanted, you know, supplemental material, but not copy the reflections like he did. I, I didn't want to be exactly what he did. I wanted to go a different route. So as all good projects arise, you get a germ of an idea, but then make it your own. And so that's what I did here. So I put out the mess. I put on message boards on Facebook, which is where I found it a couple summers ago was on a Facebook retro group. Yeah, I just put put the word out. That and it's funny. I got some blowback. I was like, "Oh, you want you know me to write for free? No thanks." And I was like, "Okay." Built into my question, I said, "This is not a paying position. This is just for fun. This is for and, and there's two reasons I didn't make it paying work. Number one is because I'm not getting rich writing these books. My primary income comes from writing for newspapers, websites, magazines. You know, just crank. I'm just down in the trenches writer, cranking out." copy for my editors with different newspapers, magazines, and websites. The books right. are vanity projects. They're fun. They get me invited to conventions. They look good on my resume when I do approach magazines and websites, wanting to do articles, that kind of thing. So the books aren't getting me rich. So I didn't, you know, if I would have paid, there's been well over a hundred contributors to these books. If I would have paid for all those, you know, that would cut deep. You know, I'm just being perfectly honest. That would cut too much into my royalties from the books, you know, just from a pure pragmatic answer. Well, another answer that's just as valid. The other reason I didn't want to pay is because I wanted these stories to be purely passion projects. Just I wanted people to write things about their memories playing the games or their memories developing the games or, or buying the games or rage quitting the games or whatever, purely based on nostalgia, fun, because they wanted to do it for their love of it, you know, and not because it was a paying gig. Because you, you would. You would lose a little essence of that, I think, if it was a paying position. There is that idea of now I have to do it for money. I didn't want to risk that. So those are, those yeah. are the two reasons I went that route. And it's funny. I got some blowback and, like, accusing me of, you know, just, like, saying all those things. I said, well, this is voluntary. I'm not putting a gun to anybody's head to say to write this stuff. Some of these people writing this are going to have never been published in a physical book before. So a lot of people are very, very excited about this. I remember 8-Bit Eric, he studied journalism in college and everything. And he said, man, this was just such a great opportunity for him to, you know, be published on a scale like this in such a nice book. And a bunch of people told me, you know, this was just such a great opportunity. So um, I feel totally justified in <laughs> you know, sending out a submission request because, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's a voluntary position. People can do it if they want. And, and everybody. Yeah that did it just had a blast you know they love seeing their name in print they love getting their stories out there and sharing the history of what it was like in the 90s gaming and buying games and renting games and all that stuff and again this book feels more than a collection of references done as an encyclopedia even though it is very much 
in sort of that kind of same idea. It feels more like a collaborative effort to me. It's like we're a part of something much larger and a much bigger family. Yeah, I really wanted the community at large to be represented. And there were some people, I, re- I don't want to name names, but there are some people I re- reached out to that I really wish would have been involved. And all they would have had to do was just take an hour or two and just write a couple of paragraphs of a specific game that I knew they had a really strong connection to. But for whatever reason, they just elected not to participate. And I, th- I thought that was a great loss. But but there are some cool names here, like Ben Reeves, the senior editor with Game Informer, wrote the introduction to volume two. John Riggs, who has a really popular YouTube channel, wrote several really good stories. He's been on our show. I like John Riggs a lot. Super nice guy, one of the nicest guys in gaming. Another guy that's along those lines is just the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet is John Lester, uh, Gamester81. He has some stories. Oh, yeah. Really cool guy. He's, they I'm just got a new Super good. Nintendo game out recently, didn't they? Yeah, the Sydney Hunter uh, with Collector Vision. Yeah. Yeah, I reviewed it for my website, brettweisswords.com, by the way. <laughs> I haven't looked at any of the reviews. I just He's on my Facebook, and I see stuff about it every now and again. Is it good? Yeah, it's a simple adventure quest game. It's you know got platforming elements. It's got adventure quest elements, and it's a lot of fun. You don't put a ton of stuff in inventory, and there's, it's not complicated. It's just a fun pick-up-and-play. For an adventure game, it's very much pick-up-and-play, which is a lot of fun. But yeah, he's done several Sydney games, you know, across different platforms. I got the Sydney game for the Intellivision, which is a lot like uh, the old, I mean, for the ColecoVision, which is, no, it's Intellivision, but it's a lot like Smurf Rescue and Gargamel's Castle for the ColecoVision, but it's uh, oh, wow. Sydney Hunter for the Intellivision, yeah. But yeah, I've got a lot of a lot of people in the community. David Warhol, who actually worked on some of the Super Nintendo games, has some stuff in there, and the SNES Omnibus books, you know, different people like that. So it's a wide range of, of people of writers, reviewers, programmers, etc., YouTubers. Yeah, it's really cool. There's a lot of names that I flick through here, and I was pretty excited just to be kind of in the same space as all these people that I really enjoy, like, reading their work or seeing them on YouTube or just whatever. And even if there, you know, there's going to be some unfamiliar names to you as you read the books, but if you flip to the back of each book, it has their bio. And- That's what I'm looking at now, yeah. Or, wow, this person has been writing about games for 10 years for this particular website or whatever, so. Now, there are two exceptions. There are two so-called industry insiders, my wife and my son. So they contributed a couple of stories just because they're sort of industry insiders by default being related to me. But if their stories weren't terrific, they would have been rejected completely. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, that's your support. Your your family's just as much part of you as you are them. And they, they have great, like my wife has a story about Street Fighter 2 Turbo for the Super Nintendo. And it's objectively speaking, one of the best stories in the book, because it talks about how this game we played early in our relationship really caused serious conflict between us <laughs> <laughs> and let's just say it more than one tear was shed over this game so we transitioned from that to donkey kong country and i think her story was actually about yeah she did donkey kong country and street fighter 2 turbo i believe if memory serves because donkey kong country is the game we started playing instead of street fighter 2 turbo because that was the cooperative game that uh, pretty much saved our marriage to make it a little hyperbolic but <laughs> her stories are great she's an english teacher she's a terrific writer my son is a history teacher and went to university of texas at austin graduated with flying colors so like i like to say i may only be the second or third best writer in my family so anyway but <laughs> so they have you know a nod to them in there so but but yeah most of them are by uh vast majority are by industry people in one form or another i wanted books people could pick up and flip to a game real quick do i want this game or not am i interested in this game or not is this a platformer does this have non-linear elements is this an adventure game is this a throwback to the old genres like there's a similar like i think whiz or something like that on super nintendo sort of like hubert whatever but within that also wanted a book you could just kick back on a saturday afternoon in your hammock and just read fun stories like you're reading a novel or something yeah so i think it covers it covers both of those it's definitely really cool now you talk about capturing that sort of story element one of the and this is a book that really surprised me i'm going to do a quick shout out to this guy i used to work with named van who's also a big game fan and he's really into like modern shooters and the indie games like binding of isaac and such and he actually was like hanging out with us one night and he's like dude you got to read this book i have and he hands me a copy of masters of doom i think it was called which is the story of the id dudes yeah i haven't read it but i've heard good things about it yeah yeah so i had this book and i didn't didn't expect to finish it. I think I sat it on my bedstand for three or four weeks before I picked it up. But as soon as I picked it up and started getting, I think, past chapter one or two, I didn't stop. I just finished it. And I rarely do that with books these days. There's definitely something to be said about that, like, 
story element with games being kind of like anchor point. Recently, there was that high score girl on Netflix, which a lot of people are really enjoying because it uses games as like an anchor rather than being the actual focus of the story. It's more about those characters. It's really cool to see like that games, we can talk about games in in lots of different ways. We can take the analytical approach. We can be really methodic in the history and stuff. We can also just talk about these really cool stories that just happen to have games in them. So I think that culturally we're finally getting to a point where we respect games a lot for what they actually are. Right, getting up there with sports and politics and music and movies and all the other subjects people care about. Yeah, just all the things that, you know, human interest. I guess the next question then kind and then tying into that is what do you think about the importance of recording these sort of things in literature form and how does that really help like game history as a whole well i read an article one time that said that x percentage of articles written about video games online are now no longer available online anywhere either that website is shut down the uh, article got deleted or whatever so a large percentage of gaming writing even some of the historically important or well-written articles or whatever just don't exist anymore once a book is printed that's always going to exist you know as long as we care about a thousand years or whatever (laughs) and so i think it's important to capture the people the places the history and print because it'll you know live a lot, lot longer than we will I think in general, when you know, like, let's say you go in what to watch a movie. If you know about the historical elements of what goes on within that film, whether it's in real life or you know about the production of the film, I think you get more out of it. You can enjoy a game more or a movie more or whatever if you know more about it, either the events that happen in the movie that relate to real life or about the production of the film or whatever. You just get more out of it. So I think you just live a fuller life if you know more about what you're doing instead of just stumble along blindly. And I think it's very easy for people to really connect that with film because, I mean, the more I learn about the production of things like Star Wars or even movies I don't really like that much, like The Dark Crystal, which I never watched, I, I, like, have very little interest in it. But I love watching documentaries of, like, how the puppets were made and how they shot it and how it was, like, all these restrictions and stuff. Yeah, right. Well, for example, okay, so The Wizard of Oz, there's one song that was left out of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, It was The Jitterbug or something. I think it might have been The Jitterbug, but it was either The Jitterbug or a song like that they took it out of the film was left on the cutting room floor because they knew the filmmakers knew it would have dated the film instantly so if you watch the wizard of oz it's not dated one second you know it's a beautiful film that holds up but if they would have put the jitterbug in there you would immediately know it was you know a 1930s film or a 1940s film i mean it was 1939 but you would know it was from that time it would have dated it immediately so just knowing that sort of just adds to your appreciation of the film and how the songs all the effects everything is just it's just a beautiful timeless film just knowing that just enhances the experience and just for me knowing more about what i'm watching or reading or whatever just sort of enhances the overall experience zach have you made any sort of connections like that with the media and film and stuff that you enjoy yeah the there's a lot of stuff that I like that overlaps with the media and film, but I don't honestly I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> I mean, let's say, do you get more enjoyment out of Metal Gear if you know like some of the story about how it was made or like the people involved? Like, does that add to it? Honestly, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. Because with my tech theater background, like I did all of those aspects to contribute to the show, and they're all awesome just in their own right. So being able to know what they did behind the scenes to build those things to be able to work with them or just see them it's a wonderful process especially all the art involved like the literature alone is just amazing and immersive in a lot of things especially like the metal gears but like the art that goes into them and the framing is beyond it with another level at some point you can overthink it probably you know and you're as as funny as a writer it's harder for me to just get lost in a book because i'm I'm observing the craft of how they wrote it (laughs) so sometimes (laughs) it's fun just to turn off your brain and watch something just as candy but overall i think it's beneficial to i mean okay so here's an example i was watching this is spinal tap with a friend of mine who's a big rock and roll fan well his interests and his knowledge of rock music is very very narrow in the fact that he just likes music and likes to listen to rock and roll well my interest in rock and roll expands much further than that and and i could appreciate the parody elements of spinal tap after 10 15 minutes he just wanted to turn it off he thought it was stupid whereas not that i'm superior or anything but just i'm just telling you the frame of reference the knowledge of wide scope of the genre of rock and roll you know i'm just laughing my head off all the way through spinal tap and then someone who doesn't really know the history of rock or you know all the rock the trappings of rock and roll lifestyle all that stuff you know appreciate the full knowledge of it you know might not get as much out of something like that 
So anyway, just like we said, just, you know, fuller, richer experience. For sure. With video games, like let's say you're playing a shooter that sort of similar to Asteroids. Well, if you never played Asteroids, maybe you get a little more, if you have, if you are familiar with Asteroids and Asteroids Deluxe and Blasteroids and the games that came after it, maybe you'll be better at a newer game that's similar to that, or you'll get more out of it, or you can just appreciate, you know, where that the mechanics came from. The game that comes to mind for me, because I grew up on the NES, is Shovel Knight, which takes inspiration from DuckTales, Mega Man, and the like. And so I was completely enamored with Shovel Knight and adored it, but I know some folks that played it and they're just like, eh, I don't know, it's just not my style. I loved it for those reasons you mentioned. I remember Travis was extremely excited about Shovel Knight, and I had no idea it was coming out or anything. I was still, I think it was the end of college for me, and things were too crazy to really know, but he was like my information go-to on games, and it blew me away. Now, this might seem like a bit of an obvious question, Brett, but I kind of want to bring it up to you anyways, because I'm always thinking about, you know, how can we preserve this sort of history? Do you think there should be more effort put specifically into literature on video games? Well, yes, and I think the literature that's being written, I think, especially with some of the self-published stuff, I think there needs to be a little more attention to editing and grammar. I mean, just as a writer geek, I see so much that could, I mean, there, there are people that are super, super knowledgeable about video games but that aren't really knowledgeable about writing. I mean, I think you need to be a writer first and a gamer second, or at least equal or something. I I think just more attention needs to be paid to the writing process, the editing process, maybe get pay for somebody to edit it. Or if you know a English teacher or somebody, you know, usually somebody will be willing to look at at something you're writing because I just see so many grammar errors and so many mistakes. Putting a bit more focus on the actual literature itself in the writing process for those that are in that idea. Another problem I see constantly is just repeating the same word over and over again. I mean, part of the literary process, part of writing is coming up with creative ways to say things and not necessarily getting out a thesaurus, but just wording something a little different. You shouldn't say the game five times in one paragraph. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I edit a lot of stuff whenever I'm not doing writing myself for, you know, sites like Marooner's Rock or whatever needs to be done that is available to me. And I see that kind of thing. Or, like, um, one of my favorite things that I like to edit out, and this is kind of a stylistic choice for me, but people who talk about, like, you will enjoy this or, or this is the type of thing that you can do, I always replace that with, like, this is the type of thing the player can do or players might enjoy this type of style just to kind of disconnect that a little bit. Either way is okay, but keep it the same and within yeah. each, like in an article to either say you or the player or some variation of one or the other of those. But if you mix them, you can get in trouble. Yeah, and there's a bunch of really cool ways you can go about like a game review specifically. I, I know every now and again I'll be like, oh, I'll start the article with a really personal kind of narrative and use I and, and, and such a lot. Or if it, we're talking about like this is our stance as like the, the paper Marooner's Rock or whatever, then we'll use the words we. We did that a lot at Twin Galaxies. So it, it's just kind of like understanding the type of thing you're writing, I think, and then how people are going to read it that kind of determines the like voice of it. And there's a, a- a book that people don't refer to as much as they used to, Strunk and White. It's a style guide that'll tell you just about everything you need to know about grammar and that kind of thing. I don't know that many gaming writers use that. What's the name of it again? Strunk and White. T-R-U-N-K and White. It's a style guide that's been a staple of writers' desks for decades and decades. I used to have an editor in college that swore by the book of fucking style or something it was called. <laughs> yeah, there, there's different ones. You know, there's rules, you know, associated press rules, if you want to go that way. But whatever style you use, try to be consistent and just don't say the same word over and over within the same paragraph. You know, that's, that's yeah. one of the most annoying things to read. No matter what your level of writing skill is, if you want to get into the idea of writing about video games or writing in general, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten from somebody was just to do it. And I don't know where that came from, but for some reason I got into the idea of, well, if I just write like a little bit every day or if I get into the idea of doing it more consistently, then that'll help out in the long run. And it does, I think. It absolutely does. As a matter of fact, uh, when I started writing for the All Game Guide in 1997, I wasn't that good of a writer yet. I had written short stories and fiction and stuff, but that was, uh, you know, work in progress. And my early stuff for the All Game Guide was, you know, a little rough around the edges. But as I went and wrote hundreds of reviews for them and then for the comics buyer's guide got a lot more polished yeah and just and and write more i mean don't just write about games keep a journal or blog or whatever you know if if you're gonna write you know do it be serious about it 
what sort of like inspirational books do you have in the gaming space or like what have been some favorites that you've seen because i mean obviously i'm kind of partial to the one that i'm in <laughs> and then i really like the masters of doom because it was more of like a narrative kind of thing yeah well phoenix by leonard herman right now it's in its fourth iteration it came out a year or two ago you know it's the history of video games that was very influential because it was the first one something that was written for adults thick book serious history of video games that was the first one phoenix and right now it's phoenix four it's the fourth edition i would recommend that because it's a good overview of the consoles that influenced pretty much everybody because it was the first one he also wrote abc to the vcs which is out of print but it was the first book covering a specific console in its entirety it had every atari 2600 game uh, right up for each and that that book played a big role in inspiring the classic home video game series because he did the atari 2600 and i decided to do that and every other system <laughs> let's see another good one game over by david chef i enjoyed that i've heard there's some you know inaccuracies in that but i enjoyed that atari inc business is fun by goldberg and vendell that's a really good book with a lot of good atari history again there's some you know grammar mistakes in there but it's it's a really good book supercade by van burnham that was one of the earlier you know full color coffee table hardcover books there were very few books of that type being published when it came out you know years ago well over a decade ago probably in 2000 early 2000s or something like that but those are the, some some of the ones i like and you know i grew up early reading like ken houston's home video those old paperbacks uh ken houston that famous gambler he wrote some video game books and then there was the playboy's guide to writing the games these are all early 80s paperbacks jeff robin's nes books were influential because just because they were published so long ago there's a book I like called Before the Crash that covers early history of video games. It's by a guy named Wolf. That was a good one. See, I've got a whole pretty good library of, of gaming books that I enjoy. The Digital Press Guides, those are good. They're not really extensive write-ups, but they're a good for checklists, for comprehensive within each system, as far as checklists, rarity guides, and all that stuff. And then some of the games have write-ups. And the old fanzines, uh, you can look on the Digital Press website, the Digital Press just put Google Digital Press Video Games, and within that website, you'll find their fanzines online. And you can read fanzines from the 90s up to the present. And some of those early 90s fanzines were pretty influential. Joe Santulli, who one of the guys that owns the National Video Game Museum, he was publishing that fanzine in the early 90s, you know, before hardly anybody was writing about uh, retro gaming. So those those are some influences. There's a, a publishing group, and I think it's called, like, Boss Publishing or something, and one of their books is specifically all about Final Fantasy V. I've listened to the guy who wrote it. Is it Boss Fight Publisher? That might be it, but there's, a, there's one on Final Fantasy V that I've listened to the guy who wrote it on some other podcast. He was on, like, Retronauts or something. That's on my list of things to get, because I love Square Enix, and I love those sort of RPGs. I really want to pick up that, and Phoenix, of course, I have talked to Leonard Herman, which I think you actually might have pointed me to him or something. Whenever I was doing the Twin Galaxy stuff, I interviewed him, so that was really cool. I want to pick up the Phoenix one, because it is that, like, monumental piece. He recently posted that the uh, the full-color edition was on sale for, like, 50 something dollars, and it's usually yeah. 80 Yeah, I gotta get that. It's well worth it. If you, it's a good overview of all the consoles. Yeah, that's a great deal. Yep, Boss Fight Books, that's it. Chris Kohler, Final Fantasy V. He works for Kotaku now, Chris Kohler. Yeah, that, yeah, that is right. Yeah, I think that writing about games or, like, writing music about games or creating podcasts, it all kind of helps in this, like, collective history mindset. And I think that the more we have of it, the better. But you're right, you, we do need, if we're going to make a book about something, then it really needs to have the same quality we would for any other major publication well it's so easy to self-publish now that it doesn't go through that you know a lot of the books don't go through that professional editing process yeah or at least as high end as you would like now did you go to school for writing or are you all self-taught i mostly self-taught i was a bad student in school i was interested in going to concerts and dating girls and you know my car and hanging out and all that kind of stuff in school Two years after I graduated high school, I barely graduated. My GPA, my senior year was a 1.8. I just barely graduated. I had a full-time job while I was in high school and had friends outside of school and stuff. So I, I like, you know, school was just a place to rest between my life, you know. And so a couple of years after school, I sort of grew up and, and got serious and I went back to college and I took some business courses and some domain courses just to, because I was going to, I was interested in business opening the comic book store, which I eventually did and then opened too. So I have some college experience, but most of the writing is just from being such a voracious reader and self-taught writing for the most part, just from observing what I read and from sheer practice. That's awesome. 
I think a lot of people need to hear stuff like that too because there's a lot of people who think about that but are really discouraged because they feel like they have to have like all this crazy professionally taught background. I've been a freelancer for a major metropolitan newspaper for a decade and never took a single college level journalism course. Now, what advice would you have for writers that want to make an actual living to be able to pay the bills and stuff with their writing? It's extremely difficult. And all along the way, I've had supplemental income as well. My writing is enough to you know, have a decent living, but to breathe a little easier, I have some sideline gigs as well, like selling stuff on eBay. I've got a booth in an antique mall. I set up at shows uh, to sell video games and stuff like that. So I've got, you know, just some little extra cash flow from some of these sideline gigs. As far as advice goes, right now, so much of writing is going online. And you just look at some of these websites that are just constantly cranking out material. And most of those have some pay rate for their freelance writers. You know, investigate that. Cracked, I think, is one of them that does pop culture in general. Kotaku is a good one for gaming. Places like IGN, places like that, you know, just look at what they are publishing and, you know, reach out to them, you know, see if they're looking for more freelance work. And I actually wrote a book called How to Get Published, 50 Successful Query Letters. You can easily find it on Amazon. The digital version is only $2.99 and it'll tell you how to approach a publisher, whether it's someone that hosts a website or works as an editor or publisher at a publishing house or that produces a magazine or newspaper. It will tell you how to write a query letter to those places to submit your ideas and it has 50 actual letters i wrote that led to paying jobs so i would i would really recommend that if you're serious about wanting to learn how to approach a publisher because you want to present your idea first in the first paragraph and in the second paragraph present who you are you don't say who you are first because they don't care they want to know about your idea if they like your idea then they'll care who you are and why you are the right person to write that so my writing career has really snowballed over the years At first, it was really hard to get anything published, but now, you know, with several books under my belt and, you know, writing for a whole bunch of different newspapers and having over 1,600 articles published, I know how to approach a publisher, and I've developed a streamlined style that editors seem to like, so it's a lot easier now to get published than it used to be, partly just based on my publishing history and the way I frame the query letters, and I know what publishers are looking for and that kind of thing. And if you have a book idea, see what publisher publishes that kind of thing but fill in a hole in the in, in that gap. For example, with McFarland Publishers, I wrote a book called Encyclopedia of Kiss, the rock band. And the reason I wrote it, because a few years ago, I was reading several autobiographies that band members had done, plus a few other books about Kiss. And I was like, you know, nobody's ever done a Kiss encyclopedia. The Rolling Stones, The Grateful Dead, The Beatles, Elvis, all the major rock acts have had encyclopedias written about them. More than one in some cases. Kiss has never had one for some reason. And so I thought, that's an obvious gap in the publishing industry. And so I approached McFarlane with that idea and they loved it. And so that was how that went about. So find a niche, find something that hasn't been covered and go for it. Well, Brett, I I do really enjoy you sitting down and talking with us. And again, I'd really appreciate you taking a chance on me whenever I submitted some of my work to the SNES Omnibus. And I'm like super excited to have both volume one and two on my shelf. And it's something that I like show off to friends at work. And it's been a real highlight of my past couple years here, like career wise. A lot of people have expressed that, you know, that they're, they're really excited to see their name in the books and to get their stories out there. And that, that's, that makes it a lot more fun. And it means a lot to me. I appreciate it. I do want to wrap up our conversation by just kind of talking about, you know, what, what sort of things are we really into right now as far as games, movies, whatever. And Zach, why don't we start with you? What have you been playing? Honestly, I've been finally completing Kingdom Hearts 3. Like I'm just about there now. That's what I was doing a little bit earlier today. Getting ready for, <laughs> getting ready for Borderlands 3, of course. I've been playing the alpha of a game called Spellbreak that is on the Epic Game Store right now. You have been telling me about Spellbreak for weeks now, and right as we speak, I'm going to go look this up and figure out what it's about. It's a type of battle royale game, but it's just basically a big fight among spellcasters. Which sounds like a great idea, first off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's in alpha, so it does not look as good as it will. They're constantly adding and updating stuff to it, but it's fun. It's very different, because you fight with two hands, so you have an extra set of controls, and you can combine the different magic that you use for your combos, or if somebody else throws one down, you can throw something else into it as well. It gets really, really dicey, really crazy. Uh, it's fun, though. It's just something different. Is there much of a community behind it yet? Uh, there's a good 
good chunk of people that I've been checking out. I mean, it's nothing like massive, like Fortnite or Apex in that regard, but there's a, a good following behind it. The Discord's pretty good. I follow a couple streamers now. They actually do it as well. Now, Brett, have you been playing anything here of late? Anything you're super excited about? During Black Friday, my son actually got a PlayStation 4, so we are now a PlayStation 4 household, which is pretty cool. And he actually got me the Crash Bandicoot collection for Christmas, so that's been a lot of fun. Been revisiting those games, and uh, I was a big fan of the PS1 Crash Bandicoot. That was excellent stuff. And been playing some Spider-Man, and I busted out the, well, I say busted out. I've got the stuff all set up in television. I'm playing some Beauty and the Beast, one of the greatest, most arcade-like games for the Intellivision. Love that game. It's a perennial favorite. That's really cool. Uh, it's really interesting to me when somebody mentions like a licensed game that's actually like really, really good. Well, Beauty and the Beast is not licensed. This is like sort of loosely based on King Kong and Donkey Kong, but it's just okay. sort of an Intellivision version. It's, it's generic. It's not uh, licensed at all, but it's a phenomenal game if you ever get a chance to play it. And you got to play it on the original Intellivision. It's excellent. Yeah, that's another one of the because I like to have I like to collect hardware and that's anything before the NES I don't really have a whole lot of so that's something that I want to get into some of that stuff. Well, the Inte- Beauty and the Beast on the Intellivision is you know you're climbing a building. It's got some Donkey Kong elements too, but it, it's fast paced and it's fun and it's there's a little strategy to it and it's uh, just it's one of the more you know a lot of the Intellivision games are sort of methodical and you've got you know 16 buttons or whatever and you've got slowly paced and it was sort of designed that way you know to be a more adult version of a gaming system compared to the tw- Atari 2600 you know more sophisticated and everything but as the system went on you know there were some arcade like experiences on it like with Astro Smash and things like that but uh, Beating the Beast highly recommended nice and for me personally I, I haven't been playing a whole lot of games this past week or so because I'm, I'm in the new job as an accounting tech and that's a whole learning curve in itself because I'm not used to that sort of work but I have got to play the tail end of Kingdom Hearts 3 I finally finished the main story and I'm just checking boxes as far as getting the lucky emblems and trying to work towards building the Ultima Keyblade. And that's, I can't say that's fun, but it is something that I'm, like, determined to do. There's nothing, it's better than some of the other games. The mini games are a little better, but, oof, it's not great. (laughs) Come to think of it, I haven't played very many good games here of late, because the other game I played is I finished Reverie, which is a Zelda-like style indie game, and I wasn't super impressed with it either. It's it's just kind of a passable Zelda-style game. So, in the gaming front, I haven't been, like, super into anything aside from Kingdom Hearts, and my interest is starting to wane on the third one specifically because of this kind of monotonous huge task i better recommend a book or a, a guy i know is going to kill me <laughs> go for it so there's this book called the minds behind the games and it's a book published by mcfarland i actually wrote the forward to it it's called the minds behind the games interviews with cult and classic video game developers by patrick hickey and he's touted my books on a lot of shows so i just want to give him a shout out it's, it's a really good book it has interviews with some of the key programmers for different games throughout the history of the industry so i, I just want to give that a shout out i also wrote the forward to the bits of yesterday that that book, that uh, DVD, uh, that movie, that documentary. I don't know if you've seen it. I don't think I've seen that one, but I've seen a lot of them. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's called The Bits of Yesterday, and it's just interviews with collectors and stuff. And the director contacted me, and I wrote the uh, forward to the documentary that you can read on, like, the inner paper that comes with the DVD or Blu-ray. So read more of my work. You can find it on The Minds Behind the Games and The Bits of Yesterday. But all my stuff you can find at brettwestwords.com, B-R-E-T-T-W-E-I-S-S, words.com. There's uh, links where you can buy the books direct from me or from Amazon. Nice. And we will be linking a lot of your stuff in the show notes. I know I've got a link to your Amazon page, your website. So, yeah, we'll definitely have direct links for anybody that's on, you know, whatever platform you happen to be on. Just open up that Google Doc and you have access to all these various links and ways to contact us. Speaking of, Zach, where can people say you want to send a question to the Forever Classic Podcast? Where's the best place to send that? The best place to send that for all of us is going to be to the Forever Classic Podcast at gmail.com. Surefire way to get us because it's just Alex and I who can look at it. Yeah, yeah, it's just us. And keep that in mind, too. Like, we may not necessarily see something, so if for whatever reason we don't get that email, find us on the Discord, which we have a link on our, our show notes. And you can always find us on places like Twitter. I'm at the number four Ever Classic 105. And you can also find our main page, Forever X Classic, both on Twitter. And there's also the Forever Classic Hub on Facebook, foreverclassicgames.com, our main website, which is just getting better and better all the time, truthfully. It's all built in Square. It's really cool, and we've got a bunch of great projects in the pipeline. Zach, where can we find you in other places aside from our, like, collective spots? 
Uh, so in other places than that, I'll, of course, be on twitch.tv slash exquisite liar. Of course, I'll be at Forever Classic Games with Alex. But pretty much all my internet stuff is exquisite liar, one word. Except for Twitter, because there's like a bot setting on my actual name. So it's exquisite underscore liar. Perfect. And then, Brett, do you have any other social medias you want to plug? You can find me at, at Brett West, C-H-V-G, which, of course, stands for Classic Home Video Games. Oh, I was going to ask you what that stands for. That makes sense. Yeah, well, those, those were the first books to cover complete console, like every game for every console, for the Genesis, NES, you know, every... So, yeah, that, those are books are important to me. So it's C-H-V-G. And then on Instagram, Brett West, I believe it's C-H-V-G also. Nice. I have been enjoying some of your photographs from these shows and, like, chatting, hanging out with the developers and whatever arcade you have to be on. So keep that stuff coming. It's it's really cool. I'll do it. All right. Well, we do want to thank Brett for coming on to the Forever Classic podcast. It has certainly been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Anytime. It's wonderful hearing everything that you've done. Thank you. We'll definitely have to have you on for like one of the more specific topics, too, or the next time a project comes down the pipeline, which what other things are you working on, too, before we go real quick? Well, I'm writing for Fort Worth Culture Map. You can find them on Facebook. I do different articles about local things, you know, restaurants opening, events, and some of it is gaming related. I try to write as much for much mainstream press as possible about video games. So yeah, you can find a lot of my work is on Culture Map right now. On brettweisswords.com, I've been posting some reviews of some older games. I just reviewed Blueprint for the Atari 5200 and Carnival for the Intellivision. So you'll you'll find a steady stream of, of content on brettweisswords.com. And if the SNES Omnibus does well and the publisher likes the idea i may do a sega genesis omnibus it just the book needs to sell well and the publisher needs to like the idea so hopefully we can make it happen perfect i know that book in specific would be super beneficial to me because i'm not very familiar with the genesis and i need more of that knowledge (laughs) nice my only genesis knowledge is the weird ghostbusters game and sonic for me it's that god awful lion king game (laughs) it's got a good art style but oh it's hard (laughs) It's it's that it, it gets, it's tough real early, like the second level or something. Yeah, it's difficult right away. At least it's beautiful. It's a nice looking game, and ultimately it's pretty good. It definitely has some tricky parts though. Yeah, it, it's that kind of like golden age era of Disney games. I, I love that era. Of course, you saw me ranting and raving about Magical Quest, which is Mickey Mouse, and I adore that game. What an what an excellent game. All right, so everybody listening out there, thank you very much for listening to us. Be sure to check out our Patreon if you do feel like supporting the podcast directly. You can also get a hold of us on our various Twitch channels and whatnot. But we do thank everybody out there, especially those that are really engaging with the podcast. In our statistics, we're seeing a lot of folks from Australia. So you folks out there, send us an email. We'd definitely like to hear from you. But as always... Thank you very much for listening to the Forever Classic Podcast, and don't forget to stay cool and just be good to each other. 